ladies and gentlemen good morning good afternoon and good evening uh, we have people logging in from all across the globe thank you so much uh, for joining this session uh, hosted by bero my name is shakti prasad i am the head of content at bero and i run the procurement espresso magazine uh, i welcome you all to the 10th edition of espresso live event an online thought leadership forum featuring procurement leaders and uh, practitioners uh, before i get started with the session just a few housekeeping rules to be kept in mind uh, housekeeping next slide yeah housekeeping. all the participants will be on listen only mode for the entire duration of the webinar uh, we will take up the questions at the end of the presentation uh, but we would encourage our attendees to key in their questions anytime during the session uh, please type them into the question box given in your control panel i mean it can be a question it can be a comment it can be an observation or a personal experience uh, don't feel shy just key them in and uh, i will read them out for you uh, there could be a lag of a few seconds uh, in between the transition of slides so please bear with us uh, in in case you have any difficulty uh, in joining the webinar or if the audio is not working for some reason or the video is not uh, visible for some reason uh, please try to log back in or key in your queries in the q and a box and my team here will try to help you now i am happy to introduce patrick falk head of strategy and transformation at pharma major roche uh, i hope you all can see him on your screens uh, in fact this session uh, is hi patrick this session is a continuation of the interview i did with uh, rosh cpo mariel baya a couple of months ago i'm sure many of you would have read that article uh, we had sent that link along with the uh, inv invites so i'm sure many of you would have read that article and today in fact we are going to discuss in depth about the new procurement model uh, as well as uh, take up your questions patrick has been leading the operating model and digital transformation for procurement at rosh uh, in fact is is driving his team to become the next gen uh, procurement function uh, he also leads the insights and enablement chapter uh, in fact this is one of the three main chapters that we will be uh, discussing shortly uh, patrick joined rosh about uh, uh, four years ago uh, after spending little more than a decade uh, in the consulting world uh, he is a very good conversationalist uh, you will all hear from him very soon uh, patrick has very deep expertise uh, in procurement and uh, Uh, many years of experience in leading uh, large scale global transformation uh, now now this is a very interesting nugget that i have uh, some time back uh, during a conversation uh, patrick informed me uh, that he had never planned to pursue a career in procurement but now here he is aiming to revolutionize the function <laughs> thank you thank you so much uh, for joining the session today patrick thank you shakti and welcome everyone uh, next slide please next slide please yes uh, patrick so first thing is right up front the circumstances leading to the transformation at rosh uh, rosh as many of you know is a very popular pharma company uh, they are at the forefront at the cancer therapeutics uh, the cancer drugs uh, are uh, you know world renowned for curing uh, the disease in fact the the circumstances one of the main circumstances is the company's popular drugs uh have started losing patent production and in fact there was a call from the ceo to free up funds for r&d and very importantly along with other functions procurement swings into action and that's where patrick comes in so patrick your observations thanks shakti yeah, i think a bit of context to start this so when i joined rosh initially as a as a consultant so my my, my last project uh, in, in the consulting world uh, was at rosh uh, before actually officially then joining uh, rosh had a very decentralized procurement organization every yeah. every division had their own procurement team even within a division we had multiple procurement teams not necessarily talking to each other using different technology different processes rather immature and very Uh, much focused on sort of procurement operations sourcing at best and lots of transactional activities i think this was identified as an opportunity for creating obviously benefits in terms of higher performance lower cost 
uh, but also um, I think it was it was seen as we need to do something here because Roche wanted to reinvest reinvest in its future, but ultimately reinvest in in patients, reinvest in in society. So bringing more uh, medical advances to to people, to patients, to society at lower cost. That's one of our ten year ambitions, uh, on top of many others um, that we have set out to to support. And procurement has been expected, requested to support this. And that's where the whole thing started um, in 2018, that uh, it needed a radical shift and a re radical restructuring of what procurement is about. And uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, that's great. In fact, it's uh, very important that procurement is playing a very key role in freeing up the funds uh, for R&D, uh, Patrick. That's, uh, that's actually a... a great uh, platform i would say for procurement to really showcase uh, its value to the stakeholders uh, moving on uh, next slide please yes yeah, so okay, so we have the uh, circumstances that is leading to the transformation so patrick so what are the objectives of this transformation program that you would like to share uh, with our audience mm -hmm. So I think what I just talked about, I guess, was a trigger. Yeah. So the, the trigger really was something needed to change. Uh, we as a function were, were called to support the, the investment into R&D, but also we as a function were expected to deliver higher performance to ultimately support many other functions to ultimately invest in R&D and become yeah. more efficient and effective. Um, how this then translated into these sort of objectives for the for the transformation program, I think is, and I would like to look at this from three different angles, sort of three themes. Number one is the sort of corporate expectation. Yeah, so when, when procurement comes together, so multiple individual pieces of a function coming together and we're, we're creating a global team, there must be efficiencies. And mm -hmm. that's what we have committed to. So we're going to increase the performance by, um, almost 50% while taking a lot of cost out. So that was one, I call this the corporate commitment. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're getting better, but also at the same time, we're freeing up money that was invested in procurement to reinvest in R&D. Ultimately, the, the getting better, delivering a higher performance, higher savings, will ultimately also help the corporation overall to reinvest in R&D. That was sort of theme one or objective one, which I call the sort of corporate one. Then there was a second bucket of, of expectation, which I brand sort of the, the business one. The business wanted a different procurement function, wanted to have a different experience um, in terms of how to engage with procurement. Higher speed, not always talk about savings. There must be more to procurement than just savings. The R&D functions, they're not necessarily interested in savings. If they can, for example, instead of running 10 clinical trials with a budget of 100, if we can help them to run 11 clinical trials, still the same budget of 100, they are happy. That's what they want. Their objective is to cure as many patients as possible. Their objective is not to do it as cheap as possible, but to do as much as possible. So business objective was there must be a better procurement. There must be a faster procurement and a more efficient procurement. And procurement, please talk about other stuff than just savings. What about the sustainability agenda? What about security of supply? What about innovation, risk management? So many, many topics were thrown at us and the business was saying, guys, I think you can help us here. Mm. And the third sort of bucket theme, which I think um, I need to mention in terms of objectives, is our own expectation as a procurement function. And yeah. I think we, we realized, and that sort of also comes back to my personal own opinion and belief, if procurement doesn't change, I think it's, going to be dead relatively soon as a function. And I think we as procurement professionals, or we as the procurement profession, we have to make a choice. And I think it's, it's, it's that time to make that choice. If you want to become better, there are many ways to become better. But if you just focus on doing it faster, doing it cheaper, I think you continue doing what you've been doing just better. But you're not going to really advance. 
Yeah, and that will lead to, in my perspective, to digitization technology slowly but surely replacing us. Outsourcing or externalization replacing us because there will be vendors picking stuff up from us and we'll, 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 we'll see this happening. The second choice and the second route that we've decided to go um, is we want to do what we'd be doing well and better, but we want, want to add significant more value to the business in many other areas than just productivity in terms of savings. And that's mm. um, th that moment I, I sort of brand as the sort of Henry Ford moment. And when you sort of look back 100 years, and mm. there's a famous saying where he said, if I had asked my customers, they would have responded, I want faster horses. Luckily, he didn't build faster horses, right? But he built cars. And mm. I keep on saying to my teams, I want to build race cars. Yeah. So which brings me back to the analogy, the analogy brings me back to my, my, my sort of choice that we as a profession have, just do better procurement or do different procurement. And I think that was our expectation, our objective, to develop a different procurement function. Mm. Okay, in, in fact, uh, being in the pharma sector, speed to market obviously is a very uh, critical uh, objective, right? So uh, how about uh, people, because we have people joining in from various sectors, various industries. So when you say different procurement, how would, you, how would they have to base their expectations on? Because for many industries, speed may not be an objective, right? Unlike pharma, for example. Uh, absolutely, and, and don't get me wrong. We, we're just not focusing on on speed only. So what we what we did, we we developed what we call our commitment wheel. We've defined sort of six objectives that we want to deliver for the business. Ultimately, first and foremost, and procurement will always do that is is productivity and growth, right? Stuff linked to savings to financial metrics. But second yeah. for us is security of supply and quality for our manufacturing organizations. Very very important. Um, third is driving innovation, right? Getting getting the business in contact with innovation, bringing innovation in, managing suppliers, developing new solutions that don't exist today. Come back to this a bit later. Also, fourth is the the entire aspect of uh, buying experience, because mm. that that ultimately also addresses the the need from the business to just interact with us differently, get get stuff done faster. Uh, Fifth, very important, is everything related to, to speed to market. Can you help me to get stuff done faster and better? Stuff I haven't done before or stuff I haven't been able to do in the speed I can do now. And another aspect, number six, also very critical for us is sustainability and risk management. So yeah. we defined outcomes that we wanted to commit to. And we had discussions with the business what do you need business? And not just like one fits all, but we actually went to the individual divisions, the individual functions, and, and sort of shared our willingness to commit to certain outcomes and sort of almost went into a, a, a negotiation, a contract, right? What do we need to do for you? And how do you want us to serve you? And that's what also led to our thinking in terms of a different way of operating. Because how procurement is set up I think in many organizations is almost like to do one size fits all. And yeah. we in, in pharma realized we have so many different functions, so many different needs, so many different divisions. We can't do one size fits all. And, and some divisions may need cost up some of the products to be in, in, in competition or diagnostics division where there's competition. Some other functions and divisions, R&D, our pharma business, they need speech and marketing, they need innovation, security of supply, lots of things. So I think um, to respond to your question, what's critical is I think procurement functions need to decide what do they want to deliver for their business in general, which often is productivity. The CEO obviously wants savings, money out, right? But what else is there? What, what does the, yeah. the business, the stakeholder really want? Or, or how to, I think an even more important question these days, how does procurement connect with the purpose of the company and mm. for us it's doing now what patients need next it's all about the patient how do we mm. as procurement contribute to the patient and that's where we i think have come to realize we need to do more than just savings because the sure. patient if your life is on the line 
you don't care so much about savings. You care, is the next medical advance available? Is it safe? And all these things. And that's where we contribute. So I think what we've done applies to many other industries, needs to be flexed, certainly. But I think what's super critical, what applies, I think, to everyone in procurement, we need to think about, and I'll come back to the Henry Ford moment, what do we want? What do we want this function to be? Just faster? Just continue what you're doing, just better? Or do you want to make a step change? Do you want to ensure this function is known for more than just productivity and savings? Cool. Uh, that's a great uh, answer, Patrick. In fact, it's a good, great exposition of a good understanding of business. Uh, you know, a good understanding of business, good grounding in the understanding of business actually helps uh, the procurement team to deliver that stakeholder satisfaction that much more. Uh, next slide, please. I think we have, we have stayed on this slide for far too long. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the three chapters. Uh, so Roche procurement is divided into three main chapters. You could see them on the screen. One is customer excellence. Uh, one is delivery, uh, insight and enablement. Uh, just to give a brief, customer excellence, the team members primarily interfere with business stakeholders uh, with the aim of uh, driving an outstanding customer experience. The delivery chapter, basically, the customer excellence team hands over the requirements uh, to the delivery team, uh, who then go out to the uh, market and fulfill business needs. So this is where the actual sourcing happens, right, Patrick? If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. And then uh, third, third chapter is uh, insights and enablement. Uh, so this uh, team is in charge of delivering category insights uh, and solutions. In fact, there's another team called resource and performance management. It's not mentioned here. It's it's kind of a horizon horizontal function. So this team's job is to ensure uh, that the three chapters adhere to the given strategy and measure them against a set of KPIs. So uh, this team also ensures that they match the needs and capacity through portfolio management uh, and resource management, which we'll come to uh, in the next slide. So, so Patrick, why these three chapters are important and how can it enhance a stakeholder satisfaction? Yeah, great question. So I think a couple of additional pieces of context, which is which is very important. Um, so, so we've we've I think gone through our transformation in two major phases. Phase one was a, a heavy restructuring of the organization, so bringing five or six individual procurement teams together, and we've created within two years um, a very traditional procurement organization, cash flow management led sort of operations and transactional procurement going across, um, presence uh, in, in multiple locations aligned to our stakeholder footprint and sort of the, the traditional procurement model. Um, two years in, uh, we've realized to meet some of the other objectives, personally our own, and the second, the business one, we need to evolve, we need to move on from there. If we keep on working in the way what we just set up literally and how many other functions uh, across other companies are set up, we're not going to meet the expectations of the business doing other stuff yeah, um, and delivering value far beyond savings. And also we're not going to meet our own expectation to basically survive as a function longer term, I think, and also to move on into what everything else procurement can do. And then we started our evolution journey, uh, which we're just completing uh, one and a half years later. And the outcome of that evolution journey is the operating model you just described. Mm -hmm. um, what, what's, what's important here is that this operating model is addressing what I shared before. So we, we wanted a stronger focus on what the business really needs and wants from us. Yeah, we, we in procurement often feel sort of, uh, I at least perceive it that way, we're almost doing procurement for procurement. Our, our default answer is, oh yeah, let's do an RFP or, or let's do some supplier management. Let, let's do some negotiation. Again, back to some of the businesses I serve, they're not so much interested in this. I, in the 15 years in consulting and the many clients I've supported, yes, the procurement functions were very interested in savings and spend and category management and category strategies. I have yet to meet really a business stakeholder who says, this is the greatest thing on the planet. I, I don't want to talk about anything else than country management. I, no one really cares so much. So I think we realized customer centricity, focusing on the business outcomes and the needs of the business is critical. 
We also realized that in order to meet the different outcomes I talked about, we need to have a much more flexible organization. And third, we realized if we want to actually deliver on many of the things that Procurement has been promising for years, innovation and sustainability and value beyond savings, we actually need to invest in that stuff. We need to create capabilities and a team that focuses on this. So this is what you see here. Um, we have created three chapters where the capabilities um, and the, the people and the resources f find their home. So customer excellence, as you explained, is a dedicated function um, with folks who are, and that's a key difference also, folks who are aligned to how the corporate is structured. So procurement usually in the past has found its own weird way to structure itself in line with something that no one else cares about. Spend, categories, supply markets, suppliers, yeah. procurement processes, no one cares, yeah, except for procurement. But we, we claim we are serving the business. How can we if we're not structured in the way, if we don't work in that way? So that we've changed. Customer excellence is structured exactly how the business is. It mirrors the business and has dedicated folks who do nothing else than sort of being the eyes and ears of procurement sitting with the business, understanding their strategies, but also selling procurement work. And they carry all of procurement targets. Yeah, very important. So they need to work with the business to be successful and they need to work with us, the rest of procurement, to be successful. Delivery is where we've consolidated everything that's core in procurement, sourcing, category management, other core procurement processes. And the key difference here, again, to address the outcomes that I shared, our commitment wheel, they are largely flexible. It's a big pool of people across many locations that basically get, get staff or assigned to work. And then the third capability, our focus here on insights, because enablement is more traditional, analytics, risk management, that stuff. Insights is something new. And I call this category management 4.0 or 6.0 even, where this team, starting out small but growing over time, is focusing on the real problems, the real business issues. And rather than what procurement does usually, hey, let's run an RFP, so the sourcing response, we really try to understand the business problem and then create with the business, with the market, a solution for that problem. And then we even offer running that solution. So one quick example, again, linked back to the ambition of the company, Russia's growth strategy, double the medical impact for half the cost of society. The business came to us and said, but we need more lab space. We need more lab equipment. We need more lab people because we want to grow. We want to double. Yeah. Um, our response was, if we just invest and buy all that stuff, I don't think we're going to deliver on the second objective, which is half the cost of society. We need to do things differently. And that's where we invested, that was our pilot, invest in solution creation, understand what are the options that we have. And then we started to work with external companies on lab robots, digitization of lab processes, outsourcing externalization of lab activities, building a whole operating model around the future of lab. And that was yeah. driven out of procurement with the business. Yeah, and that is a, is a solution to a business problem. Over time, I see more and more capacity moving from delivery into insights. Everything's underpinned, and I'll, I'll be done in a sec, by a performance portfolio and resource management function that manages the whole thing from pipeline, prioritization, ideation, resource management, assigning people to jobs, plus managing our performance very tightly. And overall, you can argue it's a bit of an operating model like a consulting firm runs. Mm. Um, and that's how we believe we can address and achieve our objectives that I outlined earlier and actually propel us into the future, not just doing what we've been doing in the past just faster, but actually step level change, do many things differently. Cool. Uh, that's a great uh, answer, Patrick. In fact, the personnel angle is very important, uh, right? And because specialization, we will discuss that. And uh, next slide, uh, Mr. Can we move on to the next slide? Yeah. So. This is my favorite, you know, uh, chapters and squads and the portfolio approach. I mean, you can see 
uh, the diagram here. Maybe we'll give a give it a minute. Uh, so before we go get onto the slide, so a question from uh, yeah, this is a question from uh, Alice and Panza, uh, Patrick. I thought uh, it'll be it's bit relevant here to you know post that one. I know we haven't formally opened up the Q and A. Uh, how did you address local procurement function? Or has the function been uh, completely centralized? I think it's a good question. Maybe you could just yeah. briefly answer it. First of all, hello, Alison. Nice to meet you again. Um, so, so I think the, the 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 local aspect, and we'll come back to this a bit later. We talk about our digital um, capability here, is is critical. And we we have in our customer excellence team also individuals who focus on certain major sites or certain regions. So there's always uh, an interaction with procurement. Um, no one feels, I don't know who to talk to. They may not be, certainly are not at their site, but there's someone always who, for my function, my division, or my region, my location, who is responsible, one single person who I can talk to. We'll come back to technology, which plays a major role in a second as well. And then, in our delivery team, if it's a pure sourcing or, or core procurement activity, there's someone responsible for picking up that job if it's not addressed through content or catalogs or technology, and it will be delivered. But there's, that's the most important thing. There are not three, four, five people who feel maybe responsible, not responsible. There's one individual responsible, addresses the need, and it gets done through the procurement machine, and the individual responsible feeds it back into um, the business to, to that particular person in in the side X, wherever this is. Okay. Uh, by the way, Alison says hi, Patrick. Uh, anyway, so so coming coming to this new operating model. So during the interview uh, that I had conducted back in November, uh, Mariel Bayer, the chief procurement officer at Roche, said a team works in an agile manner and operates in squads on a project to project basis. This is, this is very important on a project to project basis and that all the projects will be uh, wrapped under uh, portfolio management. When you have said portfolio approach, you have portfolio management to enable easy monitoring. So each squad, if I remember correctly, you can uh, correct me if I, if I was wrong, Patrick, each squad has a specific mission that they're responsible for and are accountable for delivering performance against that mission. In fact, there's a related uh, question here, you know, uh, something about the uh, category specialization, which I also wanted to ask. Uh, this is from Ulrich Richter. You know, I wanted to ask this question, but I will uh, ask Ulrich's question here. So it related to this, do you still have traditional category experts in the delivery function, you know? It's important because chapters and squads, if they work on a project to project basis, then what happens to category specialization? Yes, so so I'll answer two questions, this one and, and yours back to squads and chapters in, in one go. Um, so first of all, yes, we do have, but just very few. So in the delivery organization, we have uh, some experts that have category specific expertise where needed, the vast majority are just great procurement people who I can technically throw onto any job. Yeah, but they, they are supported by certain experts, but very, very few. That gives me great flexibility and great ability to address more with less and gives people a fantastic development opportunity. In the past, people, at least in Roche, have always shared their concern. If I'm stuck in one category, how do I get out? Can I get a rotation or assignment? Now we've got much more freedom to develop. Um, but that question also links to, to yours, Shakti, in terms of how does this thing work? Yeah. Um, and let's, let's, let's take the delivery chapter for now, because I think that's very important. There, there is a lot of work that we have to do, which you can brand is still sort of traditional core procurement work. Find a new supplier for, for a big thing, big spend. Not everything will be organized in squads. Not everything will be organized basically in, in projects all the time. Yeah, the, the, the one thing that's critical here is that everything sits in our portfolio. So we know what we need to do, what we want to do, and what we expect this to deliver, and what the expectation and needs are from the business against this weeks and months in advance. 
So when this needs to kick off and needs to be done, it goes to maybe a certain person or a certain small group of people in delivery just to get it done. And they manage this within delivery. Yeah. What we call sort of foundational work, so the, the, the core work. But many of the things we want to do in the future and get in more and more are bigger things. Things that we've triggered, for example, in insights, a solution we want to run, or the business expecting procurement to run a project that's not just sourced. That's when we create a team, a squad, a project team in the old non-agile language. Yeah? And that then delivers this particular project, leveraging different capabilities across the procurement organization, in sort of the more agile approach, two week sprints, product owner, review cycles, feedback, all that stuff. That gives us, again, much more flexibility um, to respond to the various needs of the business, engages the business through customer excellence into these projects. And again, we give a fantastic development opportunity to people across um, the procurement organization. Yeah, that work that is organized in squads, we call non-foundational, right? So something that we have to set up for get a particular job done. All of this, I think, and that's a question to an answer that wasn't asked, but it's critical here, is only possible because we've invested so much into technology and digital and content. If I hadn't done this, and if I had to run this function, based on my digital and technology maturity from three, four years ago, this would die, like almost at the get-go. Mm. Because every request from the business, even for buying pens, would almost end up in my delivery chapter and they would have to resource it somehow. Yeah. I can't work for the thousand things I have to do every day. So we've invested heavily, heavily, and I'll share more in a minute, into yeah. literally creating what many people I think have branded as the Amazon-like buying experience, to have the business self-serve, find content, get the stuff done within hopefully minutes yeah, by themselves. And the stuff that we want to do, the stuff that we need to do where we add value, that comes to us. And one final thought on this, what we did, we looked at our sort of spend Pareto, and we've identified three big chunks of spend. One, which represents sort of three to 4% of our transactions and number of suppliers, but value 70, 80% spent. That's where I want to be involved. That's where I need the best and brightest people. That's where I need procurement to be all over the place, involved from the beginning. I've got the other extreme, the opposite, most of our transaction, but very low value. That needs to be self-serve, go through technology, content catalogs. I don't want to touch, don't want to see it all. And I've got the middle bucket where I need to find creative ways, like uh, uh, self-service sourcing for the business with preferred suppliers and MSAs underneath, marketplace solutions, tail spent management solutions, all these things. Again, investment in technology and investment in digitization and ultimately enabling the business to do it themselves. And that investment, that thinking, that digital transformation that underpins this makes this model work which ultimately allows me to invest into resources like sustainability, where I'm now running many scope three projects for the business, for the entire supply chain, out of procurement, across our entire value chain, and contribute significantly to one of Russia's biggest ambitions um, in this space, which I, I would never have been even asked by the business or by the corporate to do this, but now I have the capability i've been able to invest in it and i'm able to prove that i'm doing a fantastic job and that's only possible in my opinion enabled by technology and also by a different way of working and ultimately a different mindset of trying something that is out sorry longer answer to the the, the couple of questions you've asked me sure sure but in fact this one one clarification uh, point by matthew booth uh, before we move on to the next slide. Uh, hello, Patrick. Sorry if I missed it, but are the squads working across business areas and geographies? Thanks for clarity. Yes, I think totally. Possible. So a, a squad can be anything, right? A squad okay. can be 
with resources from the different chapters, can include the business, could be local, regional, global. It's set up for the purpose of what the squad needs to solve. Yeah, cool. Uh, next slide, uh, Mr. Yeah, so this is the Swiss Alps approach that you had introduced, uh, uh, Patrick. You know, it's uh, it's like I think visually it's uh, uh, very interesting. I would say, you know, it stayed with me ever since Mariel spoke about it and ever since you explained it. So you have recently implemented a P2P system where you aim to capture 70% of the transactions. So that's the core, uh, and then the 30% of uh, transactions you expect. Uh, uh, you know, to implement it through some innovative solutions, maybe perhaps coming from startups or other companies. Yeah. So yeah. they are called as the bolt-on solutions. It's like the peaks. So the yes. P2P is the core, and the peaks there, where we have wherever you know we have marked it with a flag, uh, is the bolt-on solutions. The thirty percent, that is thirty percent of transactions, esoteric ones. Yeah. So uh, can you explain uh, the reason behind this and how it again ties back in? To your operating model we, we are getting a lot of questions by the way uh, i think we will take up the q a as soon as we are done done with this uh, slide yeah allow me three four minutes on this because it's, it's, it's a critical sure. aspect of, of course um, yeah sure sure so, so first of all the, the the swiss alps analogy um i needed a way to explain how i think about technology and how i think about digital and I think in the past, also in my time in consulting, what we've done is we've promised together with the solution provider, technology, this technology, this piece, right? Be it A or B company can do everything. And we'll work with you for the next two years to get it all done. Two years turned into five or 10 years and we're still that wasn't done. A lot of money and, and also effort was spent, but you just cannot, I think, take these big technology solutions into every, and that's how it comes back to the Swiss Alps, into every valley, onto every peak, right? What, once you realize this, you need to define what's the core, and that's the base layer of the mountain, what's the common thing, and that's what I call the connecting tissue, right, or, or, or the, the backbone. That's where you need, I think, a good, robust piece of technology, end to end that carries this but you need to complement this with different solutions and for us it's three things mainly so we're complementing our new end to end s to p technology with digital what we call digital assets machine learning components artificial intelligence rpa solutions that are either getting sort of put into the the s to p engine or sit on the side we're complementing this second bucket with point-to-point -point or sort of startup solutions and third we will complement this with certain outsourcing externalization yeah and what this means in reality is we are having a sort of hybrid between s2p suite and sort of best of breed and why this is so important because I needed something faster and I wanted something more flexible. If I work with big S2P provider for the next three, four years to get the perfect solution, the business has moved on. We have moved on. No, no one cares anymore. And I've spent too much money. So I needed this faster. I needed this more flexible and I needed something that fits my need. And I didn't want to manipulate, tweak and customize this big tanker of S2P solution for too long. Also, I needed this to obviously underpin, and that's the connection to, to your question here, I needed this to underpin my overall operating model and ultimately be a key enabler for the outcomes I committed to. And just to give you a quick example, and to tie it back what I said earlier, so we've invested heavily into um, buying and customer experience because i believe in if the business likes it same as you if you like it you do it again even though if you know and that's 
a link to Amazon as an example, I guess all of us know not everything is the cheapest on Amazon or is, is the best or whatsoever, but it's so damn easy to buy there, so it's the default to go back. And that sort of thinking I want to create in the business. I would rather work maybe with this supplier or do it this way, but actually procurement, this nice tool is so simple, so fast, so easy to use, I'll go there. And once I've got them on the platform, I can sort of work with them. I can move them towards maybe the cheaper option. I can give them the more sustainable option of suppliers, but I've got them hooked on the platform. And we've invested heavily, not only in the technology ecosystem that I just explained, but also heavily invested into content. So when the business then comes onto the platform and wants to buy something, they only interact with sort of one search bar, one chatbot. And that chatbot guides the business within a few questions to a small number of buying channels where they quickly get to action their result. And that's the link back to what I shared earlier, sort of the spend Pareto. We have worked out, I think, getting that quite well for the different elements of our spend Pareto, what kind of solution we can offer the business that sit underneath this chatbot that actually deliver what they're looking for. Quick, good procurement solutions or responses. Yeah? And this thing, this digital approach, takes a bulk of what has hit us before in terms of sourcing a quest or procurement core work so that we can start to focus and a lot of the other work that I shared earlier. That's a very detailed answer, Patrick. Uh, really insightful. Uh, next slide, I think we can skip next slide. It's I think it's about challenges, uh, Mishtun. Yeah, there is, in fact, there is a question related to this uh, by Ralph Falk. Uh, getting, uh, sorry, going from a decentralized model to a centralized one, how was the team and technical agility addressed to create uh, the situation? Great solution. I sorry. think, yeah, I think we've we've gone through a, a lot of change from a very very decentralized, very operations focused organization to what we are seeing now here and and going live with, or within four years, first decentral to central, now central to this new operating model. Um, I think on top of not only the operating model and ways of working changed. I mentioned that we have uh, almost doubled performance, took uh, a lot of cost out, and we've hired many, many new people, like in the hundreds. That is a massive change and one that needs to be managed because procurement, you cannot stop procurement, right? You cannot take, you cannot just stop it and say, I'm business, I'm back in two years and uh, hold fire, right? No. Yeah. Um, so there was always a difficult balance between change and sort of pace and rigor, but also um, business continuity. And the, the one thing that I think got us to where we are, that made us so successful, is especially after the first year of heavy restructuring, we engaged the organization heavily into all of this. We, we, we had the organization almost come up with many of the ideas you're seeing here today. We had them engaged in, in many, many of the activities on a digital side as well as on the operating model organizational side. So it was almost like a, we call this a people-driven change. Um, I don't know, COVID, I think to an extent, almost helped us because everything became digital, everything became virtual. So we were able to engage hundreds of the organization into this change and had them designing some of this, or a lot of this actually, um, and had them practice this agile ways of working as part of the transformation. So now that we are doing it, they almost feel equipped to do it that way. Yeah, this very interesting question from Natalia Varon Peria. Uh, very interesting. How does the business, sorry, how does the information or requests uh, flow from the business team towards the procurement team in order to define which or how the squad team would be set up. I think she she wants to know, you know, yeah. how the squad would be set up, how a particular squad would be set up with relation so, to the 
business request. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. So, so we're now talking about bigger work, new work, things that we haven't done before, things that is not addressed through just sourcing or through technology. There's work coming in, which is which is bigger. Um, so the custom accidents team is also using our portfolio technology where everything that we do in procurement lands, it gets prioritized. Uh, a resource manager uh, that sits over all of this um, based on basically like in consulting, the skills this project needs that custom accents also expressed then starts to look for available resources, people who want to develop in this space, people that we must have because they've worked on this before and builds together with the, the project lead, a project, a squad. And then it gets off into sort of the delivery, uh, way, the way they want to deliver this, and it gets sort of performance tracked and monitored throughout. So it's a central system, everything lands in there, the resource management process runs on top, and the project sort of management, project performance management process sits on top as well and, and sort of monitors and tracks the whole thing. Okay, uh, there's a clarification from Letitia Mandache. She's she wants a clarification. Sorry if I missed it. Uh, who's from the quote unquote business part of the squad? I think she wants to know if any business people, business stakeholders are part of the squad. Can be, absolutely. So if we need more business representation, then what we can get through our customer excellence team, so from the chapter we will absolutely have the business part of, of, of the squad. So any big projects in whatever area, um, we will definitely invite the business to be part of that. Okay, cool. So this, uh, another another question, this, this question is from Sonia Shiano. I hope I pronounced the name correctly. Uh, hi, Patrick, uh, what are the required qualifications of the procurement employees to make this approach successful? Uh, again, this is a very yeah. important question about the personnel, about the kind of training they would need and the kind of uh, expertise yeah. that they would need to make this model successful. It, it's a great question because I think, and then maybe you answer this differently. Think about yourself as a procurement professional. When you, when you talk and when you introduce yourself, what do you usually do? You, you, you introduce yourself with procurement language. I've been in procurement for so long. I've sourced this and that category. I have been exposed to negotiation ABC. I've done category management. So you, you, you talk in a language that I think is not connected to your capabilities. It's maybe connected to your experience. But I firmly believe in procurement has much, much more to offer, has great talent, and we've sort of put us into a bucket talking our own sort of savings country management language. I don't know why. And we sometimes forget about the great things that we can do and the talent that we have. And that's what I believe in. Really move from sort of talking about your expertise and the experience to focusing on your capabilities. I'm not saying that everything that is needed for, for the future here, we have already but we have much, much more than just X years in sourcing fleet. Yeah? So that's a mindset thing, and that's a sort of confidence thing. On top, ultimately over the, the past two years, and this is part of this people-driven change, we've invested into people experiencing agile ways of working. While they are designing the future, they are already practicing the future. And we've ultimately invested in, in, in training, we've invested in um, external speakers come to us and talk to us. Athletes came and talk about how to overcome failure. Many, many things we've done. Small mm -hmm. learning bits and pieces left, right and center. What I haven't done, and I almost day one when I joined and realized we need to do this, what we've done, I killed all the technical training. Yeah, I, I don't think you need to train a procurement person who's been in procurement um, the 20th time on how to do better negotiation. I think that's why we are in procurement. We, we, we can do this stuff. If we want to move on into a different procurement world, we need to focus on, on other skills. We need to train other things. And that's what we've done, right? We've accepted, we are strong technically. We need to have people experience different ways of working, train different pieces. And that's uh, how we got there. Okay, so we have a comment uh, and then I will follow it up with a question. So this comment is from 
Gulza Osnel, Osnesel, sorry, Gulza Osnesel. So as a side note, we're going through exactly the same transformation to get all the transactional part automated, no procurement touch, and the rest as a strategic project where procurement uh, is involved. Uh, thank you, Gulza, for the comment. So this this question is from Dark Riddle, uh, Patrick. Have you already implemented chatbots internally to drive automation and customer satisfaction? Uh, I don't fully understand the question. So, so that, that yes, we have we have played around with with chatbot technology in multiple areas before. We've now got this master chatbot, I call it, as our one engagement vehicle as the starting point for the business. Um, it, it is driving a lot of business satisfaction. And I link this back to, I think, our own experience, right? Uh, maybe 10 years ago, everyone was happy to call sort of a, a travel agency to book a flight and talk to them and sort of explain where you're going and why and have a bit of a chit chat, fantastic. Um, these days, we enjoy just booking it online in five seconds. Like it's all there, my profile I set up, credit card, I don't need to talk to the agent anymore. I didn't. I never want to go back. Yeah, I never want to go back to call an agent again, even though I liked it in the past. And that's what some of the feedback is that we're, that we're getting now. I, I like to engage with procurement, fantastic, but the platform and the sort of engagement vehicle you've given me is fantastic. Okay, this uh, very interesting question again from Ruben Sanchez. Who does usually take the Scrum Master role in your squads? You know, is it procurement employees or do you have uh, yep. specialized agile Scrum Master professionals, regardless Great question. of their knowledge in uh, procurement processes? Great question. So throughout um, this evolution journey over the last two years, we've trained a number of procurement professionals in Scrum uh, agile ways of working. So we have a number of Scrum masters across the entire organization in different chapters. Also in my enablement team, I've got a team that uh, is sort of specialized in this field. And for the, for the big, really hairy projects, they will take the lead in terms of being the scrum master, driving the team, doing the project management as sort of an enabling capability. Okay, uh, next question is from Russell Shao. Hi Patrick, could you please elaborate a little bit more on insights and enablement? Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of insights that procurement can bring the true value to customers? Good okay. one. Good one. And as, as I was setting up sort of insights and as, as we were coming up with this whole thing, uh, I realized we need a different value chain in procurement. Our value chain in procurement has been circular for many, many years. Yeah, so there's a business need. I then develop a sourcing or country management strategy. I execute it, I source, I negotiate, I design a contract. Maybe if I'm really good and it allows the category to do some SRM and three years after I start again and bank my savings again. That's a circular sort of value chain. Very much again, I think, based on just serving the limited value proposition that we've had. We've now developed a linear value chain and insights from understanding really the, the root cause of the problem, co-creating a solution, implementing the solution or transforming the business, bringing in suppliers, innovation whatsoever, and then running that solution, running that, this service for the business so they consume the solution. This is a very different thinking, a different approach to procurement, I think. Solutions can be anything in this regard. Can be something I co-create with a supplier, brand new, right? I can bring in a capability from the outside. I can externalize certain things and I can run it and manage it. I can bring in technology and run it. Um, so a solution can be anything that addresses the business problem, but obviously for procurement to be involved, has to do something with an external party, either existing, co-created technology whatsoever. The, the key thing here is that I'm not just like in the past, recommended a supplier who can do this for your business, but actually I come up with the solution, I co-create it and I run it. Okay. 
so next question is from yelda kabak larli uh, i hope i didn't uh, mangle the name uh, dear patrick thanks very much for sharing all these details openly uh, very valuable how did you manage the communication of this big change across the company have you worked with an external agency to run a campaign so again this is this is something that has been going on for a longer period of time right so big restructuring first couple of years then evolution to what we've got now as much as we've engaged the business the the organization so the employees who who've basically driven that change we've also engaged the business throughout this so we had sounding boards we had stakeholders involved in this we had stakeholders heavily involved in setting up our new technology in terms of content yeah and again i think that's that's something critical procurement has often when it comes to technology or digitization designed something that works for them but has not so much involved the business if i had created all that content i talked about just based on my own procurement's own opinion maybe the business doesn't like it who am i to define this is the supplier business you have to work with this is the preferred buying channel for this or this is actually a good i don't know spec you should use so i think it's all about engagement it's certainly about communication and we've learned it's a lot about co-creation and the most important thing it's a mindset change right you need to think what do they want how do they want to use it how do they want to work with procurement and it's not we as procurement know better this is supplier you get this is a spec go and do it and, and then wonder why they're not using it okay uh, that's great so we have five minutes four five minutes left on the clock so we'll try to take a couple more questions uh, patrick so this this one is from dennis sanna does the solution creation that is new solutions proposed by procurement come out of the supplier's camp or is that knowledge coming out of the few category managers uh, you mentioned great question so there are three i guess three triggers to a solution being created number one is our customer excellence team comes to us and says look I, the business has got this massive opportunity or, or problem here and it's it's something that we just cannot buy or source or we shouldn't just engage into negotiation it, it's bigger right it's, it's not an, a traditional sourcing thing that comes to us and we start, start co-creating with the business and maybe with suppliers a, a solution trigger one trigger two our delivery category management or sourcing colleagues come to us and say the business is constantly buying this thing uh, we are spending millions there must be a different way to do this there must be something different here back to my lab example we shouldn't spend tens of millions in terms of new labs there must be something else that we can do right so they are alerting us that there's something going on and we in insights solutions and starting to look into this working with the custom excellence team to understand why the business is doing this second trigger third trigger is us in insights solutions we identify there's something happening in the market right everyone now talks about 3d printing or what's making this up right or our competition is doing this other companies in our network do this at the conference we've heard about this why are not we doing this in this case we're starting to work with our customer excellence people try to sell this idea to the business gauge the appetite and then start to create that solution so different triggers but what's common is that we leverage the different capabilities in procurement yeah in particular insights and solutions working very closely with custom excellence who have access to the business who are the best friend really of the business and understand what the business needs try to either understand the problem the opportunity or help us to sell the idea that we've picked up from the market cool uh this is a comment from Christian Christensen. Uh, thank you. Uh, think, sorry, think you would find it interesting to look at pro public procurement, uh, which is developing into outcome and value-based procurement. 
that is mm -hmm. focusing uh, at the benefits for users, patients, citizens, and not the cost, etc. It's more of a comment. Uh, thank you, Christian sir. Right. Uh, I think we have just a minute left on the clock. We'll take maybe one or two questions, uh, Patrick. Uh, sure, sure. Okay, so this, this question is from Larissa Benfield. If you're not training employees on technical skills, what skills are you focusing on building? So I think for me, I'm not saying that we are not going to pick this up again. Yeah, some new joiners and, and ultimately at some point we, we need to start investing into core procurement skills again. And certainly for our delivery people, uh, we need to over time. But I think to, to underpin this change that we went through and the, the big change in how we work and what we need to do and how we do it, we needed to invest in different things. And if you look at 100% of a person's availability, if I allow five to 10%, which is a lot for development, yeah, I need to prioritize what do I develop? And we realized in order to make what we've discussed today successful, we needed to invest in where we saw the biggest gaps. And that was certainly not in technical capability. Um, and one of the additional trainings offerings, just as a, as a side note, that we're going to offer in the future is consulting 101, consulting 201. Because again, I think this is skill sets that we need across many of the, the chapters, across the many, a lot of the work that we do in the future, which to an extent you can argue is also technical training, but it's a different focus. Okay. Uh... So we'll take one final question, Patrick, uh, before we wrap up. So if, if you are a small company, do you recommend outsourcing to be able to work in this agile structure to leverage other resources? Uh, would you leverage general sourcing or experts to be outsourced at all? You know, uh, this is from Carmel Fagelman. So I think the, the, the key question is within the and I call it wider budget that you have, right? Uh, people or, or money. You need to decide how, how far can you take that, that budget, that headcount, in terms of what, what you want to deliver. I think complementing your organization with technology and with maybe some externalization is, is critical to take your budget further, even for a small company. But I think it really comes back to maturity level where you start, maturity in terms of technology and what the business wants you to do and what you want to achieve. But I think a combination of the different options is one that works well in my perspective. I mean, very general question, general answer. Um, happy to follow up offline. Cool. Uh Thank you so much, Patrick. Uh, that was a very insight, insightful session on how best to drive stakeholder value with help of the new procurement uh, operating model. We have received several more in interesting questions, but unfortunately, uh, we have run out of time. Uh, we will try and reply by email to, to all those questions that were not answered in today's uh, session. This marks the end of our session. A big thank you to all the participants for logging in today. Uh, and we will be sharing the webinar recording uh, with all our participants uh, soon. Uh, please do reach out to the email address on the screen uh, if you have any additional questions and we will forward it to Patrick. Thank you and have a good day. And to all those in Asia, good night. Thank you guys.